because he's interesting, because he hadn't been written about before, because I thought he was fascinating. And that was because nobody had really looked at the Veterans Bureau scandal before, and it was a big scandal in the early 1920s. So most people have heard about Teapot Dome, the oil scandal in the early 1920s in the Harding administration. But at the time, the Veterans Bureau scandal, of which Charles Forbes was the center, was equally important. And yet, this man had come down in history to the present as a crook. But it was never clear to me, reading through all of this, it was never clear to me what, what he had actually done. And I got intrigued by this. There was a huge good story there at the time, which was a different story. And that was that Charles Forbes was a crook through and through. And what's more, he was a jolly crook. This was a friend of, ha of Warren Harding, the president's. He, um, he was a younger man. He was a curious man in that he nobody seemed to know really what his past was. He'd met Warren Harding in Hawaii uh, when Harding had just been made a senator in 1915. The two men got along well. Uh, they became friends. And uh, when Harding became president, he appointed Charles Forbes to a job he did extremely well as director of the Bureau of, of War Insurance, which then became wrapped into the much bigger Veterans Bureau. And Forbes was raised up to become director of the Veterans Bureau, which is now the VA. And um, from from this, now I've lost my train of thought here, where, because it could go in different ways. I think there are some interesting thoughts you can get from the book to think about today, not necessarily directly comparable, but it was a very, very unsettled time. And it was a time when there'd been, in, the, in wartime, there'd, there'd, uh, there'd been a cut down, I mean, a, a clamping down of freedom of speech. There'd been a development of public opinion. There'd been a committee on public opinion, which had worked to sway the way people thought. Um, and after the war, there was all of this unsettlement. You know, there was the Washington being transformed. On, uh, with one count, there were 2,400 different offices in the war, in, in, under Wilson, dealing with war, the war, different parts of the war, economy and war efforts. The women, there was a, uh, a building built near the station, near here, uh, for women who came in to take war jobs. Uh, and you don't, just, you don't just stop a war and expect everything to go on before. There was, a, there was, how do you get from centralization of government in wartime to somehow or other a return to normalcy, which was what Harding wanted to do? How do you get there? There was a lot of unrest and there was a burst of nastiness. Uh, there was uh, people who had uh, been restrained from free speech during the war were really uh, becoming very smart and very pointed in their critiques of people. So it was, it, it was a, a kind of a nasty period altogether. Um, but on the other hand, some things worked very well. You had trains, fast trains that went across the country. You had good mail service. Um, you had a lot of upward aspiration. You had professions developing everywhere, and I, I, there was a, certainly a lot of, of, of questions arising among people who were in different parts. There were parts of the social uh, framework. That's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? It is war risk insurance. It, it was a new program put in, in 19, developed in 1917 for to provide some kind of social new social benefits for veterans of World War One. Previous veterans had had pensions, and this was extraordinarily expensive 
on the Treasury because it wasn't just the veterans, but it was their dependents and dependency insurance and so forth, dependency benefits and so forth. Uh, and the, this was a progressive uh, time. There was workers' compensation for workers in industry in, in uh, uh, dangerous jobs, and they got medical benefits as well. So the, the parallel was workers' compensation. If you have workers' compensation for getting wounded in a factory, surely you should get workers' compensation for being drafted against your will into the U.S. Army and Navy. You should get some form of defined benefits. And those defined benefits were called war risk insurance. And they were uh, life insurance, benefits for dependents, uh, sickness and, de and disability benefits. And uh, they came, as workers' compensation did, with the assumption that there were medical benefits and there were also vocational educational benefits as well. In other words, job training and ideally expectation of getting a new job. Actually, he was the fourth head of it. You could see it hadn't, the, the previous three hadn't lasted all that long. It was a very difficult job. And as, as all of these, you can see all the paperwork that would be necessary to set up this, this kind of thing. There were four million people in the military and they were drafted from all over the country. It was an amazing bureaucratic success in a way to get draft boards, to get all the people signed up, to get uh, 24 million people were, are on the records on the internet who were registered for the draft and then there was a lottery. And then you have to get them all signed up for this insurance as well. And at one point there were 17,000 people working for the War Risk Insurance Bureau because trying to get them all signed up, including offices in France getting them signed up in the trenches. And uh, by the time the, the previous director from the third director of the, of the War Insurance Bureau um, was so exhausted by all of this, he, he left, the job was open because he'd left and very quickly after that he died. He was a young man and he uh, so he became a hero in retrospect because he he was he died on the job and it was felt that the job had killed him maybe it had uh, maybe not but that was the expectation and Forbes so when Harding was looking for a job for Forbes various other jobs were suggested but when he was looking for a job for Forbes this came up and it was he was slotted into it. He was a decorated war veteran. He'd been uh, uh, a major and, the, and then a lieutenant colonel in World War I. Uh, he'd got a Distinguished Service Medal. He had run a divisional signal communications program. He was a divisional signal office, officer for the 33rd uh, Battalion and division. And he um, he was a reasonable choice for that job, and I think he did it very well. He didn't know anything about insurance, but Harding said that doesn't matter now because all of those things have been worked out. And uh, his job was really to rally people along and make sure the, the system worked reasonably well. But the war risk insurance was, was only one part of what became the Veterans Bureau because of these other benefits that had been thrown in. The Harding, well, that's a very good question. The Harding scandals were, were scandals that were um, made public in actually in the Coolidge administration, the, the administration that followed the Harding administration. Um, there was a series of investigations, congressional investigations, into various parts of the government where things had gone wrong were attributed to Harding. And one of those was the oil scandal known as Teapot Dome, which was where the Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, uh, was responsible for, trans for getting some leases, oil leases, oil in the ground leases, taken over from the Navy Department, and Harding signed this, and but then he sublet them, as it were, to uh, major oil corporations, the leaders of major oil corporations. Um, 
I think history is still out as to what his culpability was on this, or what he expected, or whether he thought he was running a business, the business of the interior, that's another question, you know, which is coming up now, or the business of the interior department, and was responsible for, for running, for making it corporate, making it efficient, make, making it efficient in business terms, or, or whether he actually was guilty in terms of taking bribes uh, for passing over oil leases. Yes, he was. He was convicted. He went to prison. I can't remember how long he went to prison because he was some... His, his case, I feel, feel very sorry for him, his case strung out for a long time. He didn't actually go to prison to the 1930s. Yes, he was the Attorney General. He was Harding's Attorney General, and briefly he was Coolidge's Attorney General too. Um, he was, he was a fascinating, these are all very interesting people. There needs to be another book on Harry Doherty. Um, I'm surprised there hasn't been, there, was a, there is a biography of him, but, it, but there hasn't been a really good history of him in the Department of Justice and what actually happened in the Department of Justice at this time. The Department of Justice was coping with prohibition, it was coping uh, with uh, uh, whole civil rights questions because of what, what the role of the FBI and how far, which was then called the Bureau of Information, and uh, all sorts of other problems. And Dougherty was a kind of hail fellow, well met. A little, you know, they, he was. That he was almost all of these three people, Dougherty and Fall and Forbes were in 1920s terms not quite gentlemen, not quite Eastern establishment or San Francisco gentlemen. And th that was a time when gentlemen were supposed to do certain things. Emily Post wrote about how you're supposed to behave in, uh, in society. You were not supposed to get too close to people. You were not supposed to pat people on the back. You were not supposed to be too informal. You were supposed to have a mask and be charming, but hold your own thoughts behind you to be reserved. And none of these three people really fell into that category. And Doherty was perhaps, he was a political operator. He appeared as a political operator. He was prosecuted. He was not found guilty. Not exactly, because more work needs to be done on Doherty. He, um, he was prosecuted with a man called Tom Miller on one case, and Tom Miller did go to prison. But th since the charge was conspiracy, and Doherty was the other conspirator, and he wasn't convicted, it still remains somewhat of an open question as to who did what. And the details, as far as I can tell, have still not been totally taken a look at. Harding's Ohio gang was, in my view, a made-up term to link these three people, together with some other people who were prosecuted, together and to call them the Ohio Gang. Now, the phrase Ohio Gang had been used in Ohio and elsewhere to, 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 um, to describe rep the Republican machine in Ohio after the Civil War, which was a rather effective political machine. And so the, the, the term Ohio Gang was sort of familiar, but it didn't include, these three people were not from Ohio, nor were they particularly connected to each other. So it's, it's, that's another question of, of, of uh, again, in my view, of uh, having an assigned term with, which, ha which carries great weight, because Ohio gang sounds, sounds evil. I mean, it sounds really serious. And uh, I, I, there was part of the book I, 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 is, is talks about the development of fiction, the whole fiction around the, the Harding administration, which developed after his death, untimely death. He died in his third year of office. So, and then when Coolidge came in, Coolidge with his wonderful image of being a cool, efficient, letting 
Congress get along with its investigations. Um, everything that was wrong that could be righted under the Coolidge administration was attributed to the Harding administration. And uh, the Harding administration then became this kind of gang-like empire in the literature. And so, there were various books. You could probably tell uh, that I'm an immigrant from England. I grew up in England, uh, went to school in England. Um, I uh, worked in England. I, I worked as a hospital administrator originally in England after college. And then I came over here, became a US citizen in 1968. So I've lived most of my life in the United States. I came with my first husband, uh, who was teaching at Yale. And then I had to go, I went back to school and did a PhD, master's degree in PhD at Yale. And uh, I've had a very, this country has been very good to me. I've had a, a very interesting career for myself. Uh, initially English, my undergraduate degree was in English and this is probably the most salient uh, aspect of my education in my, that, that, that I, I have because it was a wonderful background in terms of both English and history and writing and thinking about prose. But then I went into a, senior, a program in England for what was called senior hospital administrators in, for Britain. And I was selected into this program, went through a graduate degree in social management and then ran a hospital. At the age of 25, I was running a 100-bed hospital in London. Uh, then came over feeling rather bad because I was a woman who had said, I'm following my husband over to the United States, am I abandoning ships? I felt a little bad about that. I felt very bad about that, actually. But then I had to go, I went back to school at Yale and got, degree, got a degree in public health and did a PhD with three fields which turned out to be very interesting, epidemiology, sociology, and health administration. Now, how did I become a historian, you might ask? Well, I'm an immigrant, and immigrants are naturally comparative people. So, in, a, in some respects, when you come to a new country, you see things are new. It was, it's not so very much different. So I was just thinking about this today. It's not so very much different coming to a country in the 1960s, as I did, as looking at a country in the 1920s. So I've always had a historical perspective on all the work I've done, including the, uh, the history of medicine, the history of the medical profession, history of hospitals, and so forth. I've taught at Yale, at Tulane, and mostly at the University of Pennsylvania in history of science. No, uh, that's one of the reasons that I was able to do a huge amount of research to put this book together. So I'm having, I've been having a very good time doing this. Now, different parts of the National Archives. I couldn't have written this book say 20, 30 years ago before the internet. And the internet has really revolutionized access to historical materials. And so I have been able to find uh, records, national archives relating to the Veterans Bureau in the, in, as it was created, the Bureau of War Risk Insurance, another committee on uh, federal uh, hospitalization. And you can now get, uh, I've, I've also used and I got them, federal employment files for people in this period. Um, I've got his Leavenworth file. I've got Mortimer's FBI file. Elias Mortimer is a central uh, character in all of this. I've got his FBI file. And I, 
I, you can put an awful lot of this stuff together from disparate sources, besides books, published sources, and other sources. There are, there are so, there's so much you can get hold of. You can get uh, military records. Now, you get access to military records, which I did, both uh, in the United States, Forbes's early records in the Navy, was where he was as a teenager in the Marines, which was then part of the Navy, and then in his stints in the Army, and also of his father, who was actually uh, a cavalry man in the British Army under Queen Victoria. It's really fun what you can get these days. I think, well, for he was elected on the 10th ballot. So there was a, first of all, there was a great deal of debate at the time. And he came out as the, as the, as the candidate. And he won the Republican candidate. And he won the election. And he won the election by quite a lot. Um, he came with the image of being a calm, practical man. He also had been much more than the owner of a small town newspaper. He'd been lieutenant governor of Ohio. He'd been, a, it was obviously, he'd been a senator. He'd, he'd also been involved in national politics. He gave a ringing speech in 1912 to the, the Republican National Convention, a really good speech, as a matter of fact. So he was, he was a pretty experienced politician. And he, he tried to evoke the image of being an ordinary person, somebody you need in the White House now who is, who is a down-to-earth, practical person who will work with Congress, although that didn't work all the time extremely well. And he opened the White House to, uh, to ordinary people who wanted to visit. And I think, I think that in this period of, of turmoil, having somebody who seemed to be normal was a very good thing. That's, that's from, from the electoral point of view. That's a good question. She, um, she supported him. She sat in on poker games. She didn't play poker, but she was there. Um, it's very difficult to assess her because she comes over in two totally different ways. She comes over as a very supportive person uh, and then she's labeled as a very managerial person. And I, I, find her, I find her very difficult to assess. I think she was a complicated individual. She was clearly a very competent person. Whether or not she knew about Harding's, about her husband's affairs, he had affairs, uh, I don't know. And she protected him. She was highly protective of Warren Harding. Um, at some point, she turned against Charles Forbes because she thought Forbes was hurting her husband. But that correspondence, the correspondence that would have helped to clarify all of this, no longer exists. So it's very difficult to uh, it's very difficult to be precise because there are certain records which just are not there anymore. And she destroyed a lot of letters. She's destroyed a lot of letters from Harding and presumably to herself as well. And uh, it was this is a great pity. There's a big gap there in the archives. Forbes ran into a, a difficult period of his life when he was obviously he had an extraordinarily difficult job to do as director of the Veterans Bureau. He had to pull three different groups from different parts of Washington, all of whom have been jostling with each other, the medical group from the public health service, the vocational group from the uh, job thing, and the war risk insurance from the insurance side. And while he was doing this, he had marital problems. His wife decided, his second wife this was, decided she wanted, she couldn't live with him anymore, and she took their daughter off to Europe for 15 months while he was going through all of this difficult, uh, difficult work. 
He was in his 40s, I guess. And so was she. Um, and while, so, while, we, after she left, he, he had met, be, before he left, he and his wife had met this very charming man called Elias Mortimer. Very, very charming. And I show, there were various other cases of Mortimer before he had met Forbes. He was a con man. He was a bootlegger and a con man. And he drank a lot, apparently. But that was beside the point as far as his role with the $5,000 was concerned. He lent people money. He lent some congressmen money. Mortimer did. And he expected something in return, like putting a good word in with your prohibition director or give me a give me some sort of favor and he did this with all sorts of people he lent even Harding's sister he lent some money um, he used lending money as one way of getting into people he used people's mo moral sense in a sense in a way and he would also set people up through friendship. And he befriended Forbes. He became a good friend of Forbes, and his wife became a good friend of Forbes as well, Mortimer. Catherine Mortimer. Um, and it soon, it soon, uh, it's very strange. Mortimer was, a, beat up his wife when she wouldn't agree with him or, or say she supported him in public. And Forbes knew this, found this out, but at the time you didn't interfere with other people's marriages. So he continued to be friends with both of them. And Mortimer uh, then uh, asked, uh, in uh, 1922, asked Forbes if he could go off to the West Coast with him on a trip, on a business trip that Forbes was going on with some of his associates from the Veterans Bureau to inspect various parts of the Veterans Bureau in, on, in the Midwest and, the, and on the West Coast. And when they were, and Mortimer very foolishly said yes, he could come to this man on the business trip, which then became a tool for Mortimer to say he had, he had really been in all of the meetings and so forth, or to, in, to, to in, assume that he had when he hadn't. When they got to Chicago, Mortimer, uh, in retrospect, said they, stayed, they all stayed at the Drake Hotel, in, which was then very new in Chicago. Uh, and Mortimer said he went into a bathroom with said, come on, more Forbes, let's go into this bathroom. And while they were in the bathroom, he handed over $5,000 in $500 notes, which is not easy to cash. So he handed over this $5,000, allegedly, but there were no witnesses, and there was uh, no receipt. And according to Mortimer, he had this wonderful story again how he handed this over, and Mortimer said, and, and Ford said, well, Mort, he laughed, and then went back to playing, to shooting craps with Mrs. Mrs. Mortimer, which they were apparently doing on the Mortimer bed. So Mortimer had this wonderful story, all which, 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 which assumed bribery, corruption, merrymaking, and possibly sex. He, he, he put, all of this together in a lump, but there were no witnesses. He couldn't get his wife, Catherine, to uh, testify for him or to support him in any way. And this became a central part of the Senate hearings, Senate investigative hearings that came up, and then the trial, which was a sort of a repeat in some ways of the hearings. And it was a very good story. I mean, here, it seemed very plausible. Mortimer came from Minneapolis, literally, <laughs> and he uh, he had a record in Minneapolis of, of, of being a, a no-gooder, 
of being drunk and, have, and incurring lots of debt. Uh, even his parents, they sued him in court for, for what he owed them in room and board, which is quite an extreme thing if you think of it. Uh, he came east in 1917. He, he, he didn't register for the draft, uh, which he should have done, of course, legally. He became uh, a fixer. He tried to fix con contracts, and he probably did fix contracts, although I don't have any infor much information about that, about what contracts he actually fixed. But he, he, it was easy. there were war contracts being made the whole time. It was a very, very energetic period in trying to get um, war production going. So Mortimer became a fixer. He was very, very plausible. As Forbes said, he's very plausible. He was very plausible. He could say, you know, I can help you. I know these people at this firm. And he could go to the firm and say, I know the people in government, and put a contract together and take a cut. And he, this is what he was doing. Um, Bef and then prohibition came along, and he also became a fixer in pro in prohibition, a middleman in terms of uh, of liquor. Mortimer said he did, but there's no evidence actually that he that he did, or that or that he um, influenced any contracts whatsoever. Uh, there's one dubious contract, possibly dubious contract for a hospital in Northampton, Massachusetts, which would happen to be Coolidge's town, where uh, Mortimer said he had helped to fix the contract, but it was only Mortimer's words. And the, the uh, interesting, the contractors were never asked, the contractors who, was, who were involved in this case were never asked, either at the Senate hearings or the trial, what their version of events was. So it was only Mortimer's word that he that he fixed it. He also said he'd fixed a contract up in New York, up in New York State, for a, a hospital called Tupper Lake, a, a hospital which was a TB hospital, and he hadn't done that. Indeed, Forbes got the people, the, the Sutherland Corporation, down into Washington to ask them about it, and they firmly denied that Mortimer had ever had anything to do with it. So Mortimer was a colossal liar. He was younger. I can't remember exactly how old he was, but he was younger than Forbes. He was probably still in his 30s. He may have been in his early 40s. Forbes became director of the Veterans Bureau in 19, August 1921. And he didn't initially have any respons direct responsibility for building hospitals at all. That wasn't until after May 1922. So he didn't actually finish any hospital during his during his time, but he was involved in running, uh, in, in planning for the hospital program. And um, it came about because by 1923, there was a, a reaction to the way in which the Veterans Bureau was working. There were these three jostling groups. Forbes had put them together the physician group, the educational group, and the money group. And he had, he had been responsible for reorganizing this national social welfare program for veterans, which was a fifth, took a fifth of the entire federal budget. It was huge. And he was responsible for doing this. He had had to relocate a lot of people. He reduced staff at headquarters. He sent people out. He had to um, provide higher managers for a lot of these new regions, regional um, districts. There were 40, there were 14 districts, I think, and and everybody. You know, it was a very unsettled time. You, you're just reorganizing a whole group of people. He had 30, there were 30,000 people involved at one point in the Veterans Bureau under his administration, almost 30,000. And not surprising, there was a lot of unrest. There was, there was grumbling, although there was also a lot of, of praise. There was grumbling that appointments were being made on a political basis by pull 
it was probably true in many cases. There were there was there were people who'd been sent out to somewhere they didn't want to go. There were physicians who'd been from the public health service who'd been running the public health district, but now they weren't they weren't taken in to run the bigger districts when they were furious. So there was a lot of unrest. And if Forbes had been a wiser man, he would have resigned at this point and said, job accomplished, I've got all these things set up, and uh, now, it's, now it's time for phase two. And he would have avoided all of this, of this later stuff. He would have avoided the hospital issue, which was really a, a, another big, big set of agendas. I, it, there wasn't any one person who was out to get, get him. There was a man, the, the, the man of Senator Walsh, who ran, who was, uh, who didn't run, but was was a, he didn't run the committee because he was a Democrat, but he was part of the committee of three people, who uh, were pushing for reform of, of the Veterans Bureau and became the, in, the the investigative committee, Senate investigative committee in 1923. And they actually before while Harding was still alive. And the problem they were they were told they thought they were to they were, their remit was to look at the problems of the veterans bureau and see what they could do to help. And so this whole Senate investigating committee was not supposed to be about Forbes to begin with. It was all about let's see what we can do to reform the system, reform it from the legal point of view because the laws need to be needed to be uh, updated and reform it in the organize, from the organizational perspective. The hearings didn't take place until November 1923, and they only went for a few weeks, but they were, they, they were after several months had been done of investigation by a team of people who were uh, run by a general, General John F. Ryan, uh, who'd been uh, called upon by the Senate Investigative Committee to do this big review. It's like a huge management review. Mortimer was on the sidelines, but he became a part of the story um, in the in late before the hearings. He he testified. Um, he became really part of the team because he said he he could nail Forbes, and much of this could be laid on the shoulders of Charles R. Forbes, the director. Uh, so Mortimer was one person, and Mortimer then became the, the uh, star witness, both of the investigative hearings, focusing on, which then focused on Forbes, and then eventually of the trial. Charles Forbes broke with Mortimer in the fall of 1923. They both agree about that. Mortimer agreed with that about that too. Sometime around September of 1923, Forbes became uh, either the lover of Catherine or the protector of Catherine, or both. I think he was. He was, uh, and he, he had here. She was being beaten up. He was her friend as well. They ended up as lovers at some point. I don't know. That, that's the sort of thing you don't know in history right. because it's not it's not written down anywhere. They married in 1925 before he went to prison. He Forbes went to, went to prison. Did Mortimer, Mortimer never went to prison. Mortimer, Mortimer was very very slick. He got he got around. He got around. He, he became the chief witness at the trial. By that time. He was being paid by the Department of Justice to be a government witness. Well, they said they believed him. Well, that's what it, that's what it boiled down to in the end, because the, the trial was in Chicago. And the only major thing, major claim in Chicago was this $5,000 check. So it, the trial really revolved upon a, uh, around this this payout, if it was a payout, uh, I think that was about eighteen months. The trial was 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 just a few weeks by a jury uh, with uh, a judge who gave a very condemning speech about the whole fabric of the nation 
being threatened when you, if, if you had people in responsible positions being corrupt and by a very, with a very fiery uh, prosecutor, very effective and fiery prosecutor from the, from, who had worked with the, in, in the Department of Justice bef before becoming the prosecutor. I think so. You know, it was, uh, I'm not sure I'm not with the doctors, I would hope not, but, but uh, that, that there would be uh, 30, 30 doctors in one federal prison, you know, who were there most, we hope, hope that's certainly not going on, but yes, there was, there was in, in the sense that drugs were readily available, that addiction was a major, and alcohol addiction as well, was a major problem. We do have a major problem with that. Um, what was I thinking? I was thinking, I, I, I was thinking that uh, Forbes was actually innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. He shouldn't have gone to prison. He shouldn't have been convicted. He was convicted on the word of Mortimer, who was a known liar, uh, a very, very compelling liar, who was a brilliant witness. He was witnessed in other cases as well. Uh, it didn't mean that Forbes was without blame. He was a very, very strange person in many ways. Uh, he was very careless of his reputation. He, he irritated a lot of people. But nobody, I think perhaps the most salient part of this is that nobody in the Veterans Bureau said he had done anything untoward. You know? when they said this after he'd left. Nobody said, well, I saw Forbes one day, you know, with a bottle in his office. Nobody said that. Or I saw Forbes doing some dirty work with several of his associates. So, I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. Uh, he had uh, a very, he had a, 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 a secretary a personal assistant, a very a, a man on whom milk, Mr. Sweet, a man who was never accused of anything and was seemed to be a very upright person and remained in the federal. He came back and he remained in the federal government and was working in the federal government in the 1940s again. Um, and he he was 100 percent behind. Forbes, and when asked if anything untoward had happened, I was doing hearings. I think that's, that's a very germane piece. And his lawyer, he had a lawyer called James, Forbes had a lawyer called James Eastby Smith, who had a reputation for rectitude in Washington, D.C., taught at Georgetown, who'd written lots of stuff, uh, a very apparently blameless person, and he wrote a letter to Forbes' wife, saying this was the worst case of uh, of um, of uh, of whatever the word is for uh, injustice that he'd ever seen. So, I think he became he became I think he re he he became a scapegoat, a useful scapegoat for troubles in the Veterans Bureau and for assigning problems in government back to the Harding administration, because by the time of the hearings and the trial, Harding had been, had, had been dead for a few weeks by the time that the, the hearings took place. He stayed married to Catherine Mortimer. Uh, it's difficult to follow somebody who, for whom there are no public records. But he, first of all, he went, he and Catherine went out and lived in California for a while. He ran a gas station. Uh, which is, is is kind of a nice, nice little thing to think of him. Gas stations were sort of big deals then. Uh, he came back. They settled in Washington, and but then he also worked in Boynton Beach, Florida. He he called himself retired Army Colonel Charles. No, not Charles. C. Robert Forbes. His nickname was Bob, so that was reasonable. So he wasn't readily, Ford is a common name, he wasn't readily uh, distinguishable as the, the former, former Ford. And Catherine, the poor, the, the, the woman from Philadelphia, 
uh, who had been beaten up by Mortimer, she became a federal civil servant in the 1930s. She worked for the New Deal. She became, she worked uh, for the Bureau of the Budget. She became a placement officer in the Bureau of the Budget. And when Forbes died, she organized a magnificent funeral for him. And he's buried with honors in Arlington Cemetery. I worked on it on and off for about 10 years while I was doing other things as well. I've written about um, specialization uh, in American medicine. I've written about history of the British National Health Service from the medical point of from the, the the medical point of view and the political point of view. I've written about immigration into the United States of physicians in the 1960s and 70s, which was a big deal then um, politically. And I've written about history of hospitals in the United States, um, particularly in the in the 20th century.